I don't know. What do you guys think? Is this, are you comfortable with this? Sure. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. This is fun. I really like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Great. I wonder, um, I know, I know we need to get started because it's already 6 p.m., but let me, I, I wonder how it'll work with a share screen. Here's our, here's our title screen with your guys' names. Okay. So then we go back to this. Um, yeah, it cancels it out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this might be, maybe we'll just, let's just start with this. I'll, I'll kick it off after I say this sentence. And then, and then when we, when I stop sharing, I'll, we'll go back to the, our boardroom. How's that? Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here we go. Um, this is the um, work. This is Frontier DAO. We, I'm Paige Donner with Frontier DAO. I'm co-founder, and uh, we started about a little bit over a year ago um, in in as a decentralized science DAO. So this topic today is going to be talking to several other DAO builders and also believers in DSI. Um, about uh, what is decentralized science. So a year ago, uh, nobody really had heard the term and nobody was really using it. You know, fast forward to about January of this year, so 11 months ago, and you started to see the hashtag then a little bit on Twitter. And now it's this global full force. As you can see, we have a represent, we have Maria with DSI Brazil. We have Daniel with DSI Africa. Uh, Drew is with Crypto Altruism, and he's going to bring his perspective on um, how you can use blockchain for good. And also, he has a background in science, so he'll be able to um, communicate very clearly about the advantages to, to Web3 tooling in scientific and engineering research. Um, so uh, we have uh, the agenda today, the, the session topic is what is decentralized science, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what is the DAO, Decentralized Autonom Autonomous Organization. Um, then each presenter will have um, a little bit of time, say five to ten minutes, to present about what their organization is focused on, what is DSI for them. Um, I'd also like each presenter um, to talk a little bit too about how is this in particularly relating to your region. So Africa is very different from South America, is very different from Europe, where I am, and then from North America, where Drew is. So we almost, the four of us, kind of really represent the, um, really practically the, the entire globe. We're, we're just kind of missing Asia and Australia, right? For this for this meetup, um, yeah. and then also then for the discussion time, let's talk a little bit about can DAOs offer a path toward greater scientific engineering and collab scientific and engineering collaboration, while still protecting people's intellectual property. So that's that's really the 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 key. Um, how do we facilitate collaboration and still protect? Intell academic intellectual um, yeah. property. So before before we get um, before we get started, uh, if uh, e even even further, if you don't mind, I'm going to um, show a little two minute video, um, just explaining and introducing what. Frontier DAO is. And if you could give me a thumbs up if the audio and video is playing okay, that would be great. Frontier DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization focused on scientific and engineering innovation. It is one of the first DAOs focused on scientific pursuits, hence one of the pioneers in DSA, decentralized science. As a collective, Frontier DAO's main mission is to make scientific research, collaboration, innovation, and commercialization more accessible to wider groups of people, regardless of where they come from. Our philosophy, echoing that of NASA's, is that good ideas come from everywhere, and we are using the blockchain and Web3 tooling to help facilitate that people with good ideas, drive, and determination 
get access to funding, mentorship, peer support, and paths towards collaboration and commercialization, while still protecting their IP. Frontier DAO is committed to creating public goods by leveraging emerging technologies to benefit every human being on our planet. Catalyzing space and fusion technology incubation, Frontier DAO is working towards the vision of clean energy democracy. That is, clean, cheap, abundant, on-demand energy for all. By facilitating multiple pathways for funding for fusion energy innovation, Frontier DAO aims to collectively help make clean, affordable and accessible energy available for everyone on the planet. We aim to do this by supporting paths to commercialization of this new technology, while still protecting the rights of the inventors and researchers to ultimately create a more vibrant, abundant future on this world and off world that is shared more equally by all. Frontier DAO's work to support research as well as inclusivity in science, engineering and the aerospace industry includes adopting space technologies to earth sciences to improve the quality of life on planet Earth as we simultaneously reach for the stars and become a multi-planetary species. Visit FrontierDAO.xyz today. If you have questions or would like to know more, feel free to reach out to co-founder Paige Donner on LinkedIn. Okay. All right. So, um, thank you for that. I just wanted to um, give a little brief introduction as to what Frontier DAO is and what our, our mission is. But now I'd like to um, throw the stage over, give the stage over to um, our, our esteemed guests. Uh, really happy to have Maria, Daniel, and Drew uh, joining us today to talk about the basics of decentralized science. Um, now, I know that um, both Maria and Daniel, they each have a DAO focused on decentralized science. Um, Drew, you're, you're coming a little bit from a different angle. You have um, a, a very significant podcast in crypto called Crypto Altruism. You also have a research background. If it's not putting you too much on the spot, I was wondering if you could maybe lead off and just talk a little bit from a lay person's perspective. Um, but also someone who has a research background and, and is very, and you're also very uh, savvy and knowledgeable about blockchain. So what is decentralized science? <laughs> yeah, well, well, thank you, Paige. And it's a pleasure to be here and, and chat about this topic that I'm really passionate about. What I will say is, uh, so I do have a background in research. Um, I'm not a scientist uh, by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I have seen a lot of the pain points that uh, scientists face through my background in research and also uh, having worked for a number of uh, post-secondary institutions as well, right? And so I think that when I like to explain the, the value of DSI, I look at some of those pain points, right? One of them, of course, is, is funding, that there's a lack of uh, funding for scientific research. Funding is hard to come by. The funding might be for all the wrong things. So there might be an urgent need to fund a study to replicate. Another study was done to, to prove the efficacy of, let's say, a drug, but there's no funding for that because maybe funders only want to fund those kind of like exciting, sexy new things, right? Um, so that's one pain point. Another pain point is in terms of the researchers and the scientists being fairly compensated for their work. We all know of the uh, peer review journals that exist that bring in billions of revenue um, every year and give nothing or crumbs to the scientific researchers and the peer reviewers that are really contributing to that while, while they take all those profits on huge margins, right? Um, so it takes away from the ability of, of those researchers to be fairly compensated and, and really throws a wrench in all the different incentivization structures as well for researchers and scientists to, to do good research and to research the things that need to be researched. Um, also, just it being really kind of siloed and, and in the, you know, having uh, different uh, independent groups doing different things, but, you know, on different systems and speaking different languages. Um, so these are just some of the pain points, lack of transparency. And so when I think of the value of DSI, um, you know, where to me, the, the things that it really kind of helped with is that it puts scientific research and development um, into the hands of the community, as opposed to the gatekeepers, the big scientific journals, the traditional educational in, educational institutions, the big pharmaceutical companies. And I think that this is a game changer. Uh, each of these institutions, of course, has their place. Um, but there's also with that a lot of red tape and a lot of uh, negatives for those that are actually doing the research and, and that are trying to change the world. So 
how DeSci can help, what DeSci really is, is kind of a catch-all for using the power of Web3 to advance, you know, scientific research and development, right? And so a couple of ways that I've seen that done that to me are very inspiring. And, and one of them is the crowd, crowdfunding of public goods research. There's a lot of um, Web3 movements, collectives, DAOs out there that are making it easier for the individual to get involved in scientific research and to fund it. So to make sure that the funding is in the public's interest as opposed to you know, maybe a couple of big pharmaceutical organizations that want to make a lot of money off a certain drug, right? Um, fair compensation for scientists, like I said before. So um, a lot of these models, decentralized science models are directly funding scientists for their research, providing them a fair piece of the puzzle for contributing to scientific, uh, decentralized scientific journals or research hubs or those sorts of things, as opposed to the money going to those billion dollar journals. Um, also looking at things like crowdsource research driven by DAOs, getting a group of researchers together in a decentralized model to engage in life-changing research together. And then of course, I know we're going to talk, talk about this later, and it's not something that I'm a huge expert on yet, but the idea of IPF NF IP NFTs and you know, allowing research also to researchers to tokenize the research, retain the rights to that, and and also to you know even uh, fractionalize that out to the community if they want. So there's some really cool use cases. So I think when I look at DSI and what you know it brings to the table, it's just look revolutionizing and and future proofing these old structures that are inhibiting scientific research uh, and that are making it hard for um, for scientists to really research and you know, and put their effort into public good projects as opposed to those that are really going to make them, you know, the most money because uh, they can get funding for it. So that's kind of my uh, long-winded rambling answer of, of why I'm excited about DSI and, and, and what it means to me. <laughs> no, not not long-winded at all. You, um, to, you are very knowledgeable about blockchain and those use cases that you illustrated here. Um, I think that if somebody is just now hearing about this term decentralized science, it's going to give them not just one rabbit hole, but a dozen rabbit holes to jump down. So, so you really gave a nice high level overview of um, some of the pain points, like you said, and some of the ways that we can address those pain points with, with these tools, which is really all that Web3 is. It's just a new toolbox, right? Um, okay, so now let's turn to... Um, one of our uh, another one of our, our DSI uh, guests. Um, let's do let's do ladies first. Maria, are you ready to to tell us what you're what you're doing and what you're all about? Okay, I'll go first. Um, here in Brazil, we are just getting started with the with the SciTech market. We have a lot of health techs, a lot of agro techs, a lot of edge techs, but we don't really try and enter the business ecosystem with um, startups or companies that will try to solve problems in science. And the ones doing that are just realizing that one of the, maybe one of the biggest problems in the, in the scientific community today, other than the publication problem, Drew just addressed is the problem of how is the professional, namely the scientist, how is that person going to profit? How is that person going to earn their living? That's not clear in Brazil and that's not maybe clear in the world. I was, I'm so looking forward to hear what Daniel has to say about how is that in Africa, but here, uh, we're, we're not a continent, but we do have the size of a continent and it's so unequal. Um, so in, in one hand, we're talking about decentralizing the process that are already taking place in science for people that are already inserted, inserted in science. And for those professionals, we're trying to um, actually teach them digital tools not just in Web3, but of course, we know Web3 tooling is um, very, has a very direct relationship with profit. We're trying to bring awareness to that among the scientific community. And on the other hand, we're trying to bring all of these millions of people, of adolescents, of people between 20 and 30, we're trying to bring everyone to look at science as a possibility to create projects in whatever subject they want. That's not intuitive to most of our population. 
So I think um, my my responsibility among others that wish to join me in Brazil is to bring awareness to science. Science is now a profitable market. We can do many things. Each of us here are doing different things. So this is what decentralizing science means for me and my country. That was, that was great, Maria. That gives us a bit of an overview. And I can't wait to dig in a little bit deeper to a conversation you, you and I had, I think, over email a little bit about uh, making the next generation aware of some of the opportunities for scientific research that your country provides um, and making, making, making the youth aware in time so that they can sort of make a life plan. So cool. Daniel, let's hear about, because uh, me too, I, like Maria said, I'm so curious as to what, what's going on in Africa and how you came to de decentralize science. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Paige, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. So um, I stumbled on this side by accident. Well, I don't I don't think it was an accident because I don't know. I, I feel things happen for a reason. So I was on Twitter and I was doing some um, search and I stumbled upon VitaDAO and I joined the community. That was sometime in October last year. And I've been there for a year and we've been, I've been on the operations working group. So um, I'm currently a final year student in computer science, so, but I'm not like an academic scientist. I, I don't have any published uh, peer review article or any um, research in the aspect of science background. But I've been on the DAO for a year now, and I've been hearing about this side, and I've been I'm contributing to this side in the ways I can. And then I found out that around me, um, people did not know what I was doing. So it was more of a, um, people are aware of crypto, people are aware of DeFi. DeFi is very popular and strong in Africa, because I think we are top three. If, if you check the statistics for top five countries, like three are African countries and they are strong adopters of cryptocurrency. So DeFi, decentralized finance is a very popular thing here. But the problem is this, this side was not, is not popular yet. So I was um, around um, last month, that was during September, that was during GR15. Um, I was speaking with Vicent Weiser, one of the stewards on VitaDAO. And I was talking about my intentions to attend the ETH Safari which happened um, sometime then. And while discussing that, he mentioned that it would be good to have like a community of um, people, decentralized science in Africa, which would focus on Africa specific um, issues. And so I decided to like, let's start this side Africa. And this side Africa, we're a community that is um, taxed with supporting scientists in Africa to decentralize science. So um, there are a couple of um, problems or pain points in my region, which uh, we are identifying and we are seeking to solve. Um, for example, um, I currently in my school, I, I, I go to a government um, sec, uh, university and you have this issue in the region whereby uh, the government are not accountable to the people. So that's like a problem with most uh, countries in Africa. And so we end up with um, corrupt politicians and people who um, seize power for themselves and things like that. So most um, schools are um, underfunded. So um, I, I, I went to school in a place where we didn't have a very good lab. lab. Uh, computer science lab so we had to like depend on getting our own laptops to work and uh, learn programming and things like that so now with this side we can um, see the people and say okay um, you is there how we can support the community um, as a whole ecosystem we, are we have different players in the ecosystem we have molecule we have vitada we have this side brazil we have ibero america and um, there are lots of innovations are happening and mostly they are EU focused because EU has an abundance of um, universities in research and uh, facilities like that. So with this side, people in the region of Africa can also have access to this. For example, there's a, a this side, LabDAO, and I think would have heard of LabDAO, which allows a um, remote um, data lab with decentralized science. So for example, I could be a scientist located in Uganda and I want to run analysis for my samples I've collected and I do not have uh, that those facilities present in the lab. So once I have an internet connection and through the blockchain, I will be able to connect with LabDAO and run those research and get my results. So um, there are lots of benefits and there are also specific issues that are 
um, Africa focus. So we have the issue of uh, malaria, um, polio, and uh, HIV, which are diseases that are mostly African focused. So if we can get researchers in Africa and support them, because we have this problem whereby um, there are people who are researchers and they end up uh, scientists, they end up uh, moving over to um, coming over to Europe or America, better climates, which is brain drain is like a huge issue due to lack of funding and lack of good facilities to help push science. And so when these people go outside, they excel. So it's not about the knowledge is not there. So it's just like the lack of the infrastructures and the enabling environment for them to grow and thrive. So with this side, Africa, we're trying to um, contribute and make the environment enabling for them to grow and for them to thrive and share their ideas. Also during um, last, this week, Tuesday, yeah, we had a midweek with Shamba Network and one of the contributors there spoke about, she, um, she spoke about a project she works, which is a lab in a box, which is a STEM kit, which is, um, which is focused for students. So with this, you can have students um, in, in order to like spark their minds and let them aware of, okay, this is a possibility for you to be a scientist. This is what you can do at all. Because growing up, I've been, I believe all these things um, contribute to um, children and helping um, their minds and direct them to what they want to be. Because growing up, I, I grew up around the computer and I ended up um, chasing a computer science degree. So I believe since projects like this as where we can support and see um, the best we can do and support science, decentralized science in Africa. Thank you very much. Wow, what a great overview. It's so rich. Um, there are some common common threads about um, you know, education, you know, science and education and making that more um, accessible. Uh, so there's so there's kind of like a global common thread there because that's true in the United States and North America as well as Europe too. Um, and and yet then too now there's some there's some regional concentrations as well where things are, um, are are more are more focused on sort of the pressing needs of of, of each region. Um, I, I know with Frontier Doubt, energy is really one of the main things that we're um, focusing on in climate solutions. And so I don't think that that's regional anymore. I think that that's a global, that's a, definitely a global perspective. Um, Drew, let's let's move over, let's move back to you. And um, what about, what are some things that you think, um, you know, say you were gonna stand up uh, an, a research institution, but you were gonna make it decentralized and it would, but it would be in your area. Um, you know, how would you, you'd be focusing on, on pressing issues in your area, your region where you're living. How, what, what, what things would you be addressing and how, how do you think you'd organize it? And um, do you think academic institutions are ready for uh, this kind of um, collaborative model? Yeah, it's interesting, right? And this is something that I'm pondering kind of every day, right? Is how do we reconcile decentralization and DAOs with traditional research institutions that are heavily centralized, right? And a lot of these research institutions have, you know, some reasons for being centralized that make sense. And you're gonna, I'm gonna have to apologize. You might hear my dog barking in the background. It's probably the male, male person delivering the mail. So I do apologize. Um, a lot of these institutions are heavily centralized. Uh, they have a lot of processes in place uh, to protect uh, folks in the research processes, right? So what might seem like a lot of rep tape, these ethics processes, these sorts of things that have a you know centralized review board, all those sorts of things, there are reasons to have that in place. So it's also figuring out how do we make sure that we're replicating some of those good aspects in, in DSI, which is an important consideration, right? Um, but anyways, back to the main point, that is something that is a struggle to, to reconcile because institutions are heavily centralized. Um, when you go to a decentralized model, there is certain kind of risks that go with that in terms of where's, you know, where's this going to go, which direction is the community going to take this, whereas these research institutions like to have control over those sorts of things. So I'm not exactly sure how that's going to be reconciled and how we're going to see those two kind of come together, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are certain things that these institutions can start making use of um, in the Web3 space to kind of test the waters a little bit. Um, you know, I, I don't see that there'll be a lot of traditional research institutions that are going to be like, let's become a DAO and let's fully decentralize. I just don't see that happening. What I think I see happening instead is these Web3 decentralized research movements emerging and then partnering with uh, these traditional centralized institutions. And that's what we're seeing with 
organizations like Vita Dow and Molecule that are then, you know, partnering with universities and other research institutions to advance their work, right? Uh, and those organizations are then bringing in those decentralized, you know, elements. They're bringing in uh, community funding mechanisms. They're bringing in IP, IP NFTs. They're bringing in uh, new ways of sharing research that's on chain, that's transparent and open to everyone for the public good. Um, so what I think I would do in my community is work with, you know, folks in the local community to form a decentralized organization like a DAO um, focused on uh, funding the needs that are important to them within their community and then looking for partners within the, you know, traditional research institution to kind of, uh, you know, provide support and so that we can have the best of both worlds where there's that community driven element, but we're still able to rely on some of those, you know, uh, the expertise and the, and the, you know, all that from these traditional research institutions would still have a lot to give, right? And then I think in time, hopefully they'll see the value of decentralization and then be more comfortable with it and then work towards there. So I think it'll be a very gradual process. And I think when I talk to folks about decentralization and DeSci, it's like, okay, great, let's turn all these universities into DAOs. I think it's probably easier said than done. I, I do think that in the future, we will see a lot of research institutions and universities and nonprofits and NGOs and everything that are structured as DAOs. But I think it's more of a process of progressive decentralization of, you know, first, um, you know, sort of dipping your toes in a bit, testing it out, um, getting a feel for it, getting comfortable with Web3 and decentralization, then gradually working towards, you know, becoming fully decentralized. So that's something, that's the approach that I would take within my community. And I'm not sure if that answers your question. But... <laughs> yeah, no, that was, a, that was a wonderful, comprehensive um, answer. And uh and I think you're spot on, you know, it's going to be a gradual thing. I mean, even, even as early adopters in, um, in DAOs, I mean, you know, we're still figuring out the tooling and it's basically trial and error. It's like, oh, that didn't work or, oh, hey, that does work. So, and, so, you know, and as we were all acknowledging science and engineering pursuits, you know, in academic research, it's, you know, it's so important. It's so monumental. So you, we really need to, we really do need to get it right. All right. Before we put s such things at risk. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, re re really good points. Um, Maria, did you want to speak a little bit more to your, those points about, um, you know, making the younger generation in Brazil more aware of the, of the opportunities in scientific research that could be, um, made available to them. And also I'd love to hear a little bit more um, in detail about your company. Um, like, what is it actually that you do? Like you have a startup. And so what what is your company pursuing? Is there a particular avenue in scientific research that you're, that you're pursuing? Yeah, it would be great to talk about that. I would just like to add to what Drew just said. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's probably easier said than done to change all of the institutions and to make everything become Web3 friendly in one day. That's probably not going to be the way we'll see this going. Uh, but it's not different. Web3 initiatives are not different from other technological pioneering that has happened five years ago, 10 years ago. And the success of anything um, pioneer, in my opinion, especially when we're talking about technology, is do not forget real life, right? Um, Facebook only worked out because, of course, there was a functioning technology and there's merit in that. But that pioneer would have died without anyone finding out about the great technology he was building if everyone in campus wasn't talking about it over, um, over beer or something in bars and in class, we all watch the movie. So it's the same thing with us. Um, if we forget that science, it's academics, it's professors, it's students, it's a building, it's a lot of building, it's schools. We our, our great technologies will be will be just a small background noise um, in the face of what real life is. So the that's the real challenge. And to answer your question, Paige, about what I'm I'm, I'm doing here in Brazil, 
the goal is to address children and adolescents and undergraduates, these three publics that um, are very much within my scope of action. I want to empower them to understand they can create scientific projects and that knowledge is never going to leave them. If they have had the experience to love a subject so much, as much as you love um, fission, oh my God, fission or fusion energy, please correct me. We, we're, we're, we're trying, we're looking to catalyze fusion. So not, not fission, but, but fusion. fusion. Yeah, fusion. That, that's what fusion. we're doing. Yeah, fusion, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that any everyone between 15 or maybe I have students that are younger than that, everyone between eight and 30 is passionate about something just like you are with fusion energy. And um, I want to bring people that are in the real world, maybe people that are not aware that Web3 exists. And I want to promise them internet has possibilities for them. They will not find themselves in the job market. Oh my God, I can find a job. My scientific background's not helping me at all. This is what I hear. Uh, just like Drew, I have a research background too. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in cardiovascular multiomics. And I love cardio, I love cardio. And I'm not scared at all to be in the job market looking for something to do and ending up in a cosmetic company, maybe um, doing something I don't like. Everyone is afraid of that, even the ones that are in science in Brazil. So what my company does is to use um, ed tech, really, ed tech tooling. So info products, social networks that already exist, um, giving materials to schools, to universities. We do a lot of, pro of, of products that when they, hits the client, the client automatically understands how science, wor science works and hopefully understand that's a, a very great professional path for them. Um, I, to, to finish my, my, my talk here, um, I like to say that if we had a button that we could press and every single person on the planet understood plainly how accessing science works, in a professional perspective, the world, the world would be a better place, a greater place. So I'm trying to build that button. I, I hope you guys wanna build it with me because it's a very large button. Very nice. Yeah, you're so inspiring. Also, I love your tweets, Maria. You do some really great tweets. I think one the other day was all scientists should be millionaires. <laughs> I thought, I thought, yeah. It's just math. It's math. You know, it's it's true though. And and Drew, you've alluded to IP NFTs um, a few times, and this this might be a good opportunity to address that before we we turn that back to to Daniel to hear about uh, what his focus area is in addition to computer science. Um, but so IP NFTs, so intellectual property NFTs. Um, it, that's a, it's a great concept, and it's actually something that we um, at Frontier DAO have been um, pr practicing ourselves from, from the beginning. And that was basically that if somebody has some research that they want to um, either put out to the community um, for peer review, or maybe offer for collaboration or feedback. The, um, the wonderful thing about Web3, and I'm not talking to you guys, I know you guys all know this, but I'm talking to any, any um, current and future, future listeners, just a bit of an overview of IP, NFT, the concepts behind it, is that um, it, with Web3 tooling, you, you can publish something digitally, but you can publish it on chain, which means that it's, it has an immutable date timestamp on it. So it, so we all know Web2 publishing, right? Blogs and things. We've all been here the last 10 or 15 years, or if, if, if we have really young uh, viewers, you know, maybe they're, they're new to Web2 publishing. But basically what it means is that you can publish something 
online, but anybody can basically change it. So you know, a lot of times dates can be manipulated or it can be um, revised. And sometimes maybe the revision history isn't not noted. It depends on how conscientious the publishers are, et cetera, et cetera. So with um, on-chain publishing or IP NFTs, as soon as you publish it, the 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 data is stored um, usually as an IPFS file, um, which means it's it's on chain, and so there's a record of it. So if there's any kind of a change to it, there's going to be an additional record. So so that so this is actually how people's research and brilliance can be protected while at the same time allowing for a lot more collaboration. Um, so that's that's really what we're talking about with IP NFTs. Most people, I think, know NFTs nowadays as, as, as they say, you know, mo um, monkey JPEGs, you know, so the, um, or, you know, like the famous crypto punks or things like that. And yes, those are NFTs, um, certainly. Those happen to be um, certain kinds of images, um, but you can just as easily, um, mint intellectual property as an NFT, a non-fungible token. And there you have an immutable decentralized, immutable chronological order on the decentralized ledger technology, DLT or blockchain, as we all call it, um, that associates um, ownership ownership and, and authentication to, to that person. So anyway, I didn't I didn't mean to go so long on that topic, but it is a very interesting topic. It's something that we are working very um, diligently on and championing very much at Frontier DAO. Um, but let's turn back to, to Daniel now and hear a little bit more from, from your perspective um, from Africa. And also, I love that actually that you're in computer science because um, and also your experience in Vita DAO, which is you know really one of the pioneers. Vita Molecule and Vita DAO were the first two science DAOs um, to be stood up, and I think they established in maybe June or May or June of 2021. So we're, we're all still new, but um, yeah, let's let's hear let's hear a little bit more for, for, from you, Daniel. I, I love I love your your perspective. Yeah, the mute button. <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, um, I think I was like, thank you very much for the opportunity. So some of the pain points um we have and where we can scale is in terms of publishing. So we know um how much it costs to publish. So if a scientist to publish a peer reviewed article, it takes an average of I think about fifty thousand dollars, and it costs more if it's colored. So, which is the funny thing about it at all. So with decentralized science now, there are a, a couple of um, science and blockchain focused peer review communities and tools um, springing out. For example, um, there's one which is an offshoot of Vitada, which is TLDR, which is the longevity. I'm forgetting the full meaning, but it's like TLDR, which is similar to the whole um, too long, didn't read um, term. So it, it has a similarity with that. But it's like a, um, a, a project for scientists to have their um, journals peer reviewed by other um, credible scientists and get published on chain. So we are here by um, making it easier and more accessible for more scientists to publish and have their data um, on the blockchain. So this is also going to help improve um, scientist verification because currently now um, scientists' uh, ranking is tied to um, numbers of publications and funding you get. So you could do something which is as good as mentoring young students and you are not being uh, recognized for that because um, in the scientific community, it's not uh, what they look out for, which is fun, which is majorly funding and peer review articles. So you could um, help mentor, let's say, a group of 10 scientists in longevity field, and maybe um, a project, you can get an NFT from the project for that. This is also a way of um, helping improve um, reputation-based system on the decentralized science. On that pain point is, as we mentioned, um, lack of um, accessible laboratories. So we may not be able to have um, a state of a class or state of class um, at infrastructure present, but with the aid of the centralized science, we aim to leverage 
other communities that have this in place. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We, we believe strongly in collaboration because there's a saying in our place which says, if you want to go fast, um, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go along people. So collaboration is key in Web3. And this is a, a means for us to collaborate with other communities present in different regions like Brazil, um, EU, um, North America, and a couple of others around. And collaborating with them, we can make use of the facilities they have, the leverage on that, whereby still um, owning the knowledge and the patterns to this um, um, the researches that we make and all of that. And also a way of um, spawning the younger generation, because I feel we have we also have a saying that the, the children are the leaders of tomorrow. I don't know if it's something outside us. You know, there are some things we learn um, when, while growing up, and you think it's a universal thing, but it's just like limited to your community. So I don't know if uh, uh, children are the leaders of tomorrow is a popular phrase or so. But yeah, we believe children are, children are the leaders of tomorrow. And if we can equip them with the necessary tools currently, it can help make them become better versions of themselves in the future. So we believe in this seeds we are planting now. And we believe that even when we are gone from the earth and we are not present, there will be other people to um, continue the work and other people to benefit and the impact to have on the um, population. Because we are in the public good and we are trying to see how best we can help solve the problems that um, baffle the, um, the continent. So, yeah. Yeah, really, really interesting. Um, you know, you you also mentioned Daniel. You you mentioned GR fifteen, and uh, th that was fun. You uh, you and I not together. I mean, you were doing DSI Africa, and we were doing Frontier DAO, but uh, we, we were both um, um, participating in and so in that. And so what that alludes to is um, uh, the Gitcoin grant funding. So it's it's they use quadratic funding. Um, model, which is really interesting. I mean, it is it is the most magical, brilliant type of it. it it's called fun crowdfunding. Never. Yeah, but it, oh man, was that fun or what? Um, you know, and and that's I think how you and I first came into contact because I I saw you because we were GR fifteen was the first round to actually have a D side tag. D side, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we were we were both in the same kind of little. Uh, it wasn't really a group because it wasn't formalized or anything. But but you were you were you were cognizant of the other people in with the with the D side tag. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because I just found it to be uh, we raised we raised some money which was great. Uh, we learned a lot about quadratic funding and we came in contact with people su such as yourself. And um, that was really, for me, that was really the brilliance of, of doing a Gitcoin round is that you just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's true. It's even more fun actually to support the other people in that community yeah. than it even than it is even to get you know you know grant grant donations yourself. So I don't know. Yeah. Why don't you why don't you uh, share with us a few words, uh, Daniel, about how how that experience was for you? Okay. So um, it's, um GR15 was like our my, my first our first attempt at any grant. And uh, we got onboarded, I think, when the grant started, the day after the grant started. And it was beautiful because um, there was lots of things happening in the ecosystem. So um, I, I think um, the highlight for me was when um, I had to join um, some spaces. And in some spaces, some projects come to SHIELD. And then you hear about what this community is doing or what this project is doing. And you hear different, there are people, lots of people trying to solve a different pain points in the ecosystem. It was really, really fun because uh, I got to meet meet a lot of people um, in Bureau AM. Uh, I, I can't remember. I, I went to Shamba Networks, which we have a space last um, this week with. It was really um, GR15. So I, I got to find there was actually a refi community in Kenya, and I got to connect with them. So I think the, the highlights of the, the most important thing about um, Gitcoin Grant is the community. Because you tend to see a diverse set of people with different ideas. Because we have, um, we even have a, a women in blockchain science, web three science. We even have web three women 
Gaud and all of that. And yeah, the community is the most interesting part and also the funding, but uh, in GR in Gitcoin, you know your one dollar makes a difference because there are some people that one dollar can't really do much. It can't really uh, renew a Google Workspace domain, which got deleted. I'm mentioning it because that happened to me today. I had to renew our account and the Google uh, Business Workspace. So, but with Gitcoin, uh, the product funding, you give, you donate one dollar, and you're able to make an impact in this community. You can say, "Oh, this actually went um, a step in putting them in the right um, direction." And, um, so yeah, Kitka was it was beautiful, um, and I look to move forward to connect with more people in the community. Um, Yeah, very, very cool, very cool. Also, I wanted to um, um, throw it out there if there are people uh, in the audience who have some questions, we'll, we will do a couple minutes of questions um, in, a, in a few more minutes. Um, but Drew, I heard, I saw your, I saw your ears like literally perk up as soon as uh, Daniel talked, said, said refi, so re regenerative finance, which we are actually going to, the, the next, next week's episode is going to be um, uh, a whole deep dive into regenerative finance, but let's not leave that term hanging. Um, Cause I know, I know Drew, you are very um, much involved in, in that whole, um, you know, blockchain for good and using regenerative finance. Can you say, do you mind saying a few words on that please? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know definitely my ears perked up at refi. It's something I'm really passionate about and excited about, but also about quadratic funding. And I just want to touch on that for just a second. Like, really quite a powerful system, right? Um, being able to not say that, okay, if one person donates $100 and 10 people donate $10, that it's a wash, it's the same, it gets the same matching. No, the one with the more community support, so more people putting forward their support for it, it's almost a vote as opposed to a donation, means that it gets more matching funds, right? I think there's something really powerful about that, looking at things like participatory you know, funding models and stuff like that in the future. Um, that's just more fair and, and democratic. So really excited about that. But yeah, refi, regenerative finance, um, it has a couple different terminology definitions. Sometimes it's used, um, you know, as kind of a catch-all for those uh, finance projects that are supporting kind of, you know, addressing climate change and, you know, carbon drawdown and those sorts of things. Sometimes it's more focused on the regenerative uh, economy principles. Um, so there's a couple different terminologies for it, but generally in Web3, it's often used for, uh, those those Web3 projects that are uh, using the regenerative principles to make sure that um, financial tools, uh, finances, money is is being equally distributed throughout the world. And also uh, for projects that are using uh, Web3 to address climate change, right? So those that are tokenizing things like uh, carbon credits uh, to take them off the market to drive up the price of carbon credits to incentivize corporations to engage in more sustainable practices or those that are creating systems for more transparently auditing carbon credits or uh, those that are tokenizing rainforest so that they're protecting them from development uh, for future generations or those projects that are coming up with creative models to, to fund tree planting. Or, or those. So there's many different ways that it's being used in practice. But I think that this is one of the most uh, exciting opportunities for for, for Web3 is how it can be used to um, to combat climate change. Because when we hear about crypto in the news, it's often the negative, right? Uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, proof of work uh, are things that obviously are energy intensive, that take a lot of energy. Um, but there, And that's where the focus is often given. So people think of crypto and Web3 as just terrible for the environment. But really, and even the United Nations themselves have acknowledged this, that blockchain and the tools behind Bitcoin and, and crypto are really powerful when it comes to combating climate change for holding governments accountable, being able to transparently audit uh, carbon emissions and one's environmental footprint to being able to efficiently get aid to those that are impacted by uh, disasters uh, caused by climate change, right? So the potential there is really, really exciting. And um, yeah, I think a good, if you're looking for a, a good kind of resource on that, we have some great podcasts on crypto altruism about that, where we brought in some refi guests, including the Cello Foundation, which is really pioneering uh, refi. Uh, but also, you know, I know that the Refi DAO is a podcast as well, which is a really great resource too. So yeah, really exciting space.
Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. And and actually, um, full, full disclosure, I was just um, I, I I was just invited to join um, the founder circle and the, that Refi DAO puts on. Yeah, so they just had. Congrats. The first, yeah, thank you. Yeah, really excited about that. They just had the first call uh, yesterday. So it'll be the, the next eight, eight weeks, I think eight, eight to 10 weeks, eight weeks. So really looking forward to, to learning more about it, seeing what everyone's up to. Um, yeah, Cello is rocking it. And um, yeah, and then some of the things that they're doing in Brazil, um, you know, some of what like regenerative finance is doing in areas where, um, you know, for reforestation and, um, and rainforest planting, like actually tokenizing, like you just alluded to, rather than just planting a tree, you actually tokenize the exact that tree. So on chain, you can actually follow that exact tree. So so there's no more randomness with anything, which which is great for for, for traceability. Um, any any thoughts, um, M Maria? I wanted to um, uh, not necessarily on regenerative finance, but I just wanted to, to give you the stage again in, in case there was something that you wanted to um, speak to that I didn't know to ask about or maybe something that came up in what the conversation so far. Um. I'm actually learning a lot about refi now. Um, um, fintechs are not really my expertise. But I was thinking about the environmental impact and how much more scientists should be in the, the great decisions in the world. Here in Brazil, we have um, great, great, um, well, a great forest, I was going to say, a great treasure. Um, and many in most cases we we don't ever have governments that care not only about science but about the the possibilities that technology brings so it's not even the existence of the technology is is that impacting really um there are other problems that technology cannot address yet but it will be once the cultural change comes with it and that comes with decision making coming from people that understand the, the subjects we're talking about here and that's why i say scientists should be millionaires i think that sentence it's really powerful because it means when um when power is in the hands of people who have studied that actually understand technology that the world becomes that much more resourceful Yeah, really, really great points, Maria. You are you are really well spoken. Next time, I'm going to have to ask you where you learned your your English because I know P Portuguese must be your first language. So your English is great. No, really, really good. Um, I want to throw it out in in case if there's somebody from the audience who has a a question, you're more than welcome to unmute and ask the ask a question. Um, you know, we'll give that a a minute or two, and um, otherwise. We will turn to to wrapping up. We're at the la, you know the final five minutes, and so I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows where to find you guys. You are all doing such wonderful work, and um, I'm just honestly, I'm just really, really pleased that you know he, you know here we are sitting in this virtual boardroom together, you know, talking about DSI, and you know we're we're starting to pull the whole world you know cl you know closer together right um through this thread of 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 decentralized science funny how decentralization can actually bring us closer together it's it's kind of a paradox um uh, but it's one that i i really appreciate um if there's okay i mean if there's i want to give it an, i want to give people a chance to to ask any questions if there's if there's any um Okay, well, if there if there if there's not, then we're we're done. We're just we just have a couple more minutes left. So let's go, um, Daniel, Maria, and then Drew. Can you guys just tell us, um, you know, exactly, um, um, 
exactly where um, you're, uh, what you're doing and where we can find you and all that kind of stuff, yeah. Go, go ahead, Daniel, if you want to mute. So, well, you can always reach out. Uh, our details are there. And you can find anything you want to know about us, um, links to our relevant communities. We have a community on Discord, we have on Telegram. And so, yeah, those are our two um, channels. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us here. Page from Frontier Now. I just sent on our chat. Um, how you guys can find me. We're Desai Brazil on Twitter. This is my personal Instagram. And below, it's the website of my company. It's all Portuguese. It's all Brazilian for now. But I do hope we become global by 2024. <laughs> Cool, awesome, and uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Daniel, uh, Maria, Paige. It's been a pleasure. Um, so, if you want to learn more about me, my DMs are open. You can always get in touch. Um, my personal uh, is actually at uh, EW Simon. I'll throw everything here in the in the chat. But uh, yeah, my Twitter for crypto altruism is there, and then our website cryptoaltruism.org. We have a podcast. We're at about we're at seventy six episodes now, as well as a blog. Uh, we have close to two hundred articles all about. The social impact use cases of Web3. So yeah, check it out, shoot me a message. You can contact uh, me through the website as well. So thanks so much for having me, Paige. You guys, this has been an awesome discussion. Really, really grateful and really grateful for our um, our foundational support too from Filecoin Foundation, from Unfinished, um, and um, also from um, the Liberty Project. So really grateful for them to put their 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 muscle behind um, supporting us in this new DSI venture and getting the word out to as many people as possible. And uh, thank you guys for um, coming on the inaugural uh, workshop session. I, it was it's been great sharing this moment with you. And let's let's all stay in touch and keep keep collaborating and keep you know keep supporting each other. Um, yeah, it's, this has just been, this is just a great spirit. So uh, we at Frontier Dow XYZ really appreciate all of you and are thrilled to have met you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Paige, let me just ask you, wh where is the recording going to be? Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, we'll, I will have to get back to you. It'll eventually be up on YouTube. Um, but it'll be a question of, um, here, let me actually.